Uh, welcome, everybody, and it's good to um, uh, be able to gather today for our for our assembly. I have uh, I have one community announcement, uh, positive community announcement, which is just keep masking and distancing kids and and adults. Uh, keep pressing down and bearing through the last you know few weeks or month of of what we really have to do to stay uh, focused and safe as a school and as a town and as a country. Uh, uh, Dr. Walensky, who's the head of the CDC. Uh, and, and President Biden have asked uh, really for mask mandates to be reinstated, which is, as you know, is a, that's a state decision. So uh, the president's called on governors to reinstate that. So they're obviously concerned about spring weather and resurgence. Um, but, you know, Williston has proven time and again that uh, if we follow the rules and, and, and do our part, we're stronger together. So this is just a plug for uh, all of you to just keep at it. And, and while I'm at it, uh, please use your tracing app on your phone um, if you if you have those on your phone. So and if you don't uh, talk to somebody and, and download that so we can keep the tracing app going. Um, today, I'm going to stop talking because I'm so happy uh, that Bob Grenier, uh, Robert Grenier is here. He's class of uh, Williston class of 1972, friend of the school. He's a member of the Heads Visiting Council. Uh, one of the best parts of my job is getting to go around the country and meet uh, various Williston alumni of all ages and, and from all backgrounds. Um, and what's really cool is uh, over 11,000 Williston alumni, what they've done with their lives, what they're doing today. So uh, class of 2021, good on you. Um, you're the ones who are going to go to college and then, and then you know, make me a proud head of school as I find out what it is you're going on to do with your life after, after Williston. In the case of our honored speaker today, uh, he left Williston, then went on to Dartmouth College, and then had a, uh, I have to call it, a phenomenal 27 year career uh, in the Central Intelligence Agency, in the CIA, where he rose to the very highest heights uh, of the CIA without becoming actually the, the director. Uh, no offense, no offense there, Bob. <laughs> but um, for you historians who are historical historian buffs as I am, um, our speaker was the, was the head of the, uh, of the Afghanistan and Pakistan um, office of the CIA on 9-11. Just imagine that, right? Imagine uh, that 9-11 happens and, and in your job, you happen to be the station chief, the bureau chief uh, of those two countries. Just remarkable. And I've had a chance to talk to Bob offline at various times when I'm down in DC to hear a little bit about that and, and some of his other background. So, you know, 27 year uh, career in the agency. I just want to read this because I think this is super cool. Uh, Mr. Grenier is a recipient of the CIA's Distinguished Intelligence Medal, the Distinguished Career Intelligence Medal, the DIA Director's Award, the DCI Director's Award, and the Donovan Award. Um, I don't know all the awards that they give at the CIA, but I'm guessing there are not too many left. Um, and so uh, without bragging more about one of, uh, one of our own and one of our most distinguished alums, uh, I will turn over to uh, Mr. Robert Grenier, who is going to um, talk to you today about uh, really expanding on an article that he wrote about a month ago, maybe it was longer, uh, in the New York Times, uh, to talk really about what's going on in America right now. What is it? What does domestic extremism look like? Um, I hope he gets into how do you know what you know, and and sort of how do you how do you form uh, fact based opinions about things. Um, but anyway, he'll be he'll be talking about some of that subject area. So without further ado, uh, please uh, a warm Williston welcome to Mr. Robert Grenier, class of 1972. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. That was a very generous introduction. Um, it's uh, I'm, I'm particularly pleased uh, to be invited back. Uh, I was actually invited to speak at an assembly back in September of 2018, which is already becoming a long time ago, I guess. Um, and uh, it was a real treat for me at, at the time to be able to, to do that uh, in person. And uh, and so I'm, I'm very pleased to be uh, to be invited uh, to return virtually. Uh, that may only be an indication that memories fade, but in any case, I will take it. Um, uh, so what I'm hoping to do today is to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the ideas that I tried to develop in that piece that Bob just referred to. It was an op-ed. Uh, of mine that was published in the New York Times back on the 27th of January. And what I was trying to do there was essentially to come to grips with what I thought was the enormity of what happened on the 6th of January 
uh, in the nation's capital. And uh, I'm not quite sure where all of you were. You, you were probably in class, either in person or virtually. Um, but the, the, uh, the events of that day were local news here. And, uh, and of course, there'd been a big buildup to it. And, uh, and so, and on that day, as you know, a uh, large group of uh, supporters of then President Trump uh, came from all over the country. They got on buses in Michigan and, and Missouri and came to Washington, D.C., about 30,000 strong or so. And they listened to a speech on, at one end of the, of the Capitol Mall and uh, got all fired up. And a significant number of them then marched to the other end of the mall and they clashed with the police on their police lines around the Capitol. And they broke through the police lines and they broke into the building and a number of them were involved in, in vandalizing the, the building. Um, uh, one woman was shot by a, an officer as she was trying to break into the house chamber where uh, a number of uh, Congress people and their staff were sheltering in place. Uh, there were over a hundred police officers protecting the Capitol who were uh, injured that day, one of whom uh, died of his injuries. So it, it was a, an enormous event, it was a shocking event. And uh, in the subsequent days, as we began to learn more about what had actually happened, we saw that there were a, a significant number, uh, a disproportionate number of individuals among those who broke into the Capitol, who were actually members of organized extremist groups, uh, the Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, the, the, the Oath Keepers and others. And uh, while there, there, it seems clear now that there was an element of forward planning on their part, it's just as clear, it seems to me, that they could not possibly have gotten through the police lines and broken into the Capitol to try to interrupt the, uh, the constitutional process of certifying the electoral votes if it hadn't been for that th those thousands of uh, individuals who were behind them and who basically swept them over the barricades and into the building. And, you know, I guess maybe our memories are already beginning to recede a bit, but uh, there was great concern at that time, and particularly in the period between the 6th of January and the inauguration on the 20th of January, when uh, people were thinking that this might just be the, the lead edge of a sustained wave of violence. And uh, as I'm sure uh, most of you will, will recall, there were a great number of police and National Guard who were deployed at state capitals all around the country. So it was, it was very clear that something very significant was going on. And it seems to me that it's just as clear now that something very significant happened that day and is still continuing to this day. And so as I was trying to grapple with that and trying to figure out what, to get my head around this, trying to figure out what, what on earth is going on here uh, in our country, and it dawned on me that, you know, actually, I, I've kind of seen this before. And I, I thought about the, the experiences that I've had in places like uh, Afghanistan uh, and Iraq, where I've, I've seen insurgencies. And, you know, it, it seemed to me at first that this must be an exaggeration. But as I thought about it more, it seemed clear to me that, you know, really what we're beginning to, to see here is, is an incipient insurgency inside the United States. And again, I don't want to make too much of that analogy, and it is an analogy, but it seemed to me that, that there, there were at least three major elements of a classic insurgency that we were seeing, are seeing, in the United States of America. And uh, the first uh, is the insurgents, the, the individuals who are who are organized, uh, who are willing to and are engaged in violence on behalf of a particular political cause. Secondly, though, there's a much larger number of people comprising a significant element in the concerned society who have grievances and who uh, are not able peacefully to address those grievances and who therefore uh, provide at least tacit support, uh, moral legitimation, if you will, of the insurgents, even if the vast majority of them are not willing to engage in violence themselves. So those are the first two elements. And then the third element that I see here is what you might refer to as, uh, as inspiring leadership, or symbolic leadership, charismatic leadership. And that without putting too fine a point on it is what is provided, I believe, by former President Trump and, uh, and other political leaders associated with him. And uh, maybe uh, just as importantly, uh, significant media personalities, particularly on the right side of the political spectrum. 
So you look at all of that and you begin to, to think, well, my God, you know, maybe uh, what I'm seeing here in my own country is something that I never thought that I would ever see in this country. And, and that is, you know, these the outlines of an incipient insurgency. But I, I want to, I want to, um, has, I, I, uh, I uh, rush to, uh, to reassure folks, however, that um, I, I do this with a, a certain sense of proportion. Um, you know, we all have to be very, very careful. You know, we, we are all the, the products of our experience. Uh, if we're not careful, we, uh, we can easily be, be misled by our own experience. And I'm certainly not about to suggest that the U.S. is now or is likely to become in the future anything resembling what happened in Afghanistan or Iraq. Instead, what I was trying to do in that op-ed was to provide myself and others a, a way of thinking about the problem. And it seems to me that, that the use of that counterinsurgency insurgency analogy in thinking about the problem is only useful if it helps to suggest ways of addressing the problem. And so if we continue you know, with, that, with that model, if you will, uh, it seems to me that it also suggests the three principal ways in which we need to deal with what I think is, uh, is a, a, I don't want to say an unprecedented situation in our country, but certainly the first situation of its sort uh, that we've seen in many, many years. And the first element of the solution, if you will, that's uh, implied by the model uh, has to do with the insurgents themselves. That, that is that the people who are actually engaged in violence and or are conspiring to engage in violence. And again, their the numbers are relatively small. Um, and it seems to me in some ways that is the, the easier part of the problem to address because the, the behavior that we're concerned about, the violence and the, and, the, um, uh, and the planning for violence that we're concerned about is already illegal. And law enforcement at the federal, state and local level are very well equipped to deal with it. And we've seen the alacrity with which uh, law enforcement has been able to identify and to arrest people who actually broke into the Capitol. And although there are some people in law enforcement who would argue that you know, we need to have new and better, more powerful laws, uh, that we need, um, you know, maybe we need to have a, a domestic terrorism law, um, I, I would argue very strongly against that because it seems to me that, that we have to avoid both the fact and also the, uh, the implication that we're somehow trying to form a, a thought police that, that we are we are trying to um, uh, pursue individuals just on the basis of their political beliefs and that of course is anathema in this country and it's something that we absolutely have to avoid so again while there might be some marginal uh, benefit to be derived from from, uh, from passing new laws I, I think that that the unintended consequences of doing that would be uh, prohibitive and, uh, and, and that therefore we, we should simply enforce the law as it exists right now. So if we, that's the first element. If we jump over the second element and just talk for a second about the third element, you know, the, the, the charismatic leadership, uh, it, it seems to me, as I said in that article, that the, the people who are responsible for uh, helping to motivate the violence that we saw on the 6th of January and that uh, we're, we remain concerned about to this day, uh, need to be diminished in some way. Now, I don't want to talk about that too much. That, that really gets into very strongly political stuff. I'm sure that there are people who are on this call who uh, collectively hold very different views about former President Trump and, um, and about those uh, who support him. Uh, but to the extent that uh, there are individuals who, um, uh, who are encouraging uh, a, a set of beliefs which helps to inspire people to violence. It seems to me that's a dangerous thing and something that, that, that needs to be addressed. But what I would like to spend the, the bulk of our time on and what I, I'm hoping we can get into a discussion concerning is the second element, which I, I think is by, by far uh, in a way the most important element and the one which I think engages all of us as citizens. And in classic counterinsurgency terms, you think in terms of driving a wedge between uh, the violent few, and the much larger number of individuals who, although they are not inclined to engage in violence themselves, uh, are inclined to see uh, those who are engaged in violence as somehow struggling on their behalf. And when we think in sort of classic uh, 
sociological terms about what drives populations to violence or to tacitly condone violence. It's when they have a set of grievances for which um, peaceful means of redress are unavailing. In this country, when people want to redress uh, perceived injustices, we do it at the ballot box. We do it through elections. And when you convince a significant number of people that the elections are valueless, that in fact, uh, the elections are, are, uh, are being stolen from them, then it seems to me you justify a level of violence that people would never consider or, or condone uh, under other circumstances. And that's precisely what I'm concerned about here, that uh, groups like the, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers uh, have uh, differing uh, degrees of, of, uh, of racist and white supremacist uh, overtones. Um, the, the, they're the sort of people who would, in this country, certainly be, be marginal at best, although their underlying strength, we are told by, by people in Homeland Security and law enforcement, has been growing uh, over the, the, the past number of years. Still, that they are a marginal group, but they become much less marginal and, is, and essentially uh, enter the mainstream if they are seen as, being, as sharing the, uh, the primary concerns of that much larger population uh, and are seen as, as being, if you will, sort of the, the, the defenders uh, of, that, of that much larger population. And I just saw some things today that I can share with you later on, uh, if appropriate, as we get into the, as we get into the discussion. So the, the question is, well, then what do you, what do, you do about it? What's, what's driving this? Well, it, it seems to me that, that we have had uh, for quite a number of years in this country, a very uh, distinct and wide political Divide. And you can characterize it in uh, in different shorthand ways. You know, there's a clear distinction between uh, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, we see it breaking down along both demographic and geographical lines. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the history of recent national elections in the United States, and you look at the results county by county, it's really quite stark. The, the, you've got the uh, uh, the urban areas that are bright blue, and you've got the relatively rural areas that are bright red. And, and that has been consistent for quite a number of years. But it, it seems to me that the, the reason we're having this conversation now is not because of that sort of fundamental political divide in this country as, as important and as serious it is for us to, uh, to address. Uh, it seems to me what has put us into a qualitatively different place is this whole idea that the election has been stolen, what some refer to as the, as the big lie. And again, I, I think that you know, putting my myself in uh, in the shoes of those who are really feeling aggrieved about the election, I would share their outrage if I had felt that this election was stolen. And apparently, there is still a majority of Republicans in this country who either strongly believe or at least strongly suspect that this election was in fact stolen. So it seems to me that that is a discrete fact. That is something which is knowable. And why is it that we don't collectively know it? Well, I think there are a number of reasons for that. One, as I think Bob was alluding, is that we, we have you know, very different information universes in this country. That you know, people, uh, for instance, like me, who you know, take their, their news from publications like uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Atlantic Magazine and the New Yorker uh, are living in a very different uh, fact environment than are people who are getting their, their news uh, at Infowars and um, and a number of these uh, these right wing outlets um, where the the uh, the facts that they are being fed and with uh, with a great deal of certainty are are diametrically opposed uh, to the things that I myself. Believe, and it seems to me that it's extremely important for all of us as citizens to engage in dialogue with one another, uh, to begin to uh, to deal with it, with this problem. And, and part of it, I believe, you know, from from you know, my side of the spectrum, if you will, that it it's it's because of a lack of cl uh, critical thinking uh, on the part of many. But as soon as you begin to say that, uh, I think it's extremely important that we all do that with a um, with uh, a sense that you know, we ourselves are, are not uh, infallible. 
And so if, if I believe very strongly that this election was not stolen, it's incumbent upon me uh, to provide fact-based evidence to that effect. And it seems to me that the facts are out there. Uh, you know, in, in Georgia, the Office of the Secretary of State has done a great deal uh, you know, to, to try to answer you know, the, the many charges of voter fraud that occurred in that state. The same has happened in Michigan, the same has happened in, in other places. Um, but I think that the vast majority of people aren't going to engage in that sort of a painstaking effort. Uh, and instead, they sort of uh, deal with it in a shorthand and, and they, they take the word of uh, individuals uh, whom, whom they trust and, uh, and who they think share their, their general worldview. And that, I think, is really is the, the, the problem. And it's a very, very difficult one for us as a society, I think, to, to get our, our arms around, both in the immediate context uh, of, the, of the election, was there a steal or not, but, but also um, much more generally and much more fundamentally in, in terms of, again, the, the, uh, the thought environment uh, in which, uh, in which we, we are um, uh, we're engaged in, and, and where our, our thinking is marinated. So maybe I will just leave things there. There's a number of ideas that, that I have uh, that may help to get at, at uh, how we begin to, uh, to address the, this, this epistemological challenge, if you will, how we know what we know. Um, how we know what we think we know. Um, but maybe I, I'll just, uh, maybe we can get into that in the, the question and answer. I've probably already spoken too long. And uh, so I will turn uh, to Kate to uh, maybe feed in some, uh, some questions and some discussion. Great, thank you so much. Um, if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask themselves, just go ahead and do the hand up, raise hand thing. Otherwise, go ahead and type them in the Q&A and we'll get a discussion going. Give it about a minute here, see what comes through, and then um, okay. Miss Cody, we're going to bring you forward here. Hmm. Hi, this is this is Liam. Um, you might have to just show your uh, or Liam or Liam. <laughs> So my question is, how do you deal with sort of these like self-sealing conspiracies, like this idea that like uh, there's proof that the uh, election wasn't stolen and this is backed up by the decisions made in multiple courts across multiple states across this country, but then sort of the, the rebuttal that comes in well, but the, the, the courts are rigged um, and they can't be trusted as well. And this is some massive conspiracy. Yeah, I, I, I heard similar things uh, as well. Uh, I think there are a number of folks who maybe uh, don't take quite as an extreme view that that is to say that well, that the, the, the courts are all rigged, et cetera, et cetera. And, and of course, that, that becomes an argument that's a little bit harder to make when you're talking about judges uh, who were um, who were Trump appointees, as, as some of them were, uh, but there are a number of, of folks out there who are making the the claim with a certain amount of of, of evidence that well, look, most of these uh, these court challenges were thrown out for uh, procedural reasons, or, or because the the, uh, the the people who were making the claims didn't really have standing, and the courts really didn't take enough time to actually uh, drill into. Uh, the facts and the affidavits as they were presented at the time, uh, and therefore that these uh, these court decisions really don't uh, amount to what uh, what some people claim they do. And um, it, it seems to me that that's the sort of thing. It's very very hard uh, to 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 get around because it involves a, a tremendous amount uh, of effort, and uh, and you really have to start marching through all of the different. Uh, conspiracies uh, and uh, and fraud theories that are out there, and and there are there are scores of them. Uh, so I, one of the things that I I wondered about, I've spoken to people about, including uh, some folks in a, in a couple of foundations and in uh, one of the leading uh, think tanks uh, here in town, that the Atlantic Council, is well, what if you could you know, find support and funding uh, to put together you know, some sort of a uh, a widely credible commission, uh, which was comprised of individuals who taken collectively would have a great deal of credibility, you know, 
pretty much across the, the political spectrum and had them take a look at all of the evidence you know, to, to look at, at some of the uh, of the uh, the conspiracies that, who, that just you know seem to many on one side of the issue or the other uh, to be wild and completely uh, incredible. Go ahead and take a good faith look at all of those things, march through all of it, and then come up with conclusions that uh, that people collectively, whatever side of the of the divide they're on, uh, would actually place some credence in. And um, I, I'm having a lot of trouble finding uh, uh, people who are willing to uh, to support that notion. And and in in fairness, it, that that sort of of an effort is much easier to describe than it is practically speaking uh, to actually conduct. And you know, and frankly, I'm I'm at a, a bit of a loss. I mean, the, there there are a lot of individuals on the right who I think are are uh, intellectually honest and, uh, and well-intentioned and who would be willing uh, to engage in that sort of an effort, whether they would have uh, credibility with the significant numbers of people who, for instance, you know, uh, listen to Alex Jones, who was the, the famous uh, conspiracist and the, and the head of, uh, of InfoWars, whether there's anything that could really appeal uh, to those folks uh, over the, the voices of the people they're inclined to listen to, I honestly don't know, but it seems to me that it would at least be worth making the effort. Great, thank you, Liam. Um, we have a number of questions. There's three or four questions that have all come through that are wondering about the word facts. You know, we keep hearing from, from one side, you know, these are the facts, and from another side, these are the facts, and these are the alternative facts. And we're just wondering if you could comment on, you know, what do we believe? What are actually the facts? And how is this word being thrown around and maybe misused at times? Yeah, it, and uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we, we've been talking about that as a, as a society for, for, quite some, for quite some time, you know, in terms of alternative facts. Um, and sometimes alternative facts are just the, the, the the, the genuine facts which tend to get ignored by the other side when they're trying to, to marshal evidence for their point of view. Uh, so a lot of that is just sort of tendentious. Um, what, what's really shocking to me is, is the amount of information that's out there that's just flat false and which is being perpetrated by individuals who have to know that it's false. And you know, their, their motivations often are not that hard to trace. Uh, they're, they're feeding information to a, um, uh, to a, a population uh, from which they uh, profit, both, both monetarily and otherwise. Uh, but still, I, I have to say that it's, it's extremely shocking. And, and that's what's really, really difficult I, I think to uh, to deal with, but yeah, I, it seems to me that the only way to counter that, very broadly speaking, is to demand is to demand evidence. So you know, just to take you know, a random example that happens to, to come to mind, and, and 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 mind you, when we're talking about you know people who are who are listening to and believe a, a very different set of facts than than, for instance, I I listen to, we, we're not talking about some alien distant population. You know, I mean, uh, I, I'm from a large and, and close family. Two of my brothers, you know, have serious doubts about whether this election was free and fair. Um, a, a very close personal friend of mine with whom I've, I've served overseas, not in, in a government capacity, but, but in doing other work, smart guy, educated guy, um, but he's got a, a certain uh, political orientation. There's certain things that he wants to believe, um, in, in my view. And and he he tends to be susceptible to thoughts which reinforce what it is that he wants that he wants to believe. And as I've engaged in conversations with him, you know, I, I've had to do it in a very humble way to say, well, look, you know, if, if I'm going to make an assertion here, I, if, if he's making assertions and I'm making counter assertions, nobody makes any progress. So I, I actually have to cite evidence for my assertions, and I, and I can't say that I have I I have always. Uh, convinced him uh, in certain limited uh, instances I have, but I, I think that at least uh, each of us has, uh, has appreciated uh, the ability uh, to, uh, to understand what it is that is shaping the thinking uh, of the other side. 
uh, and to and to engage on that. So when he he brings you know quotes to me, I can say, well, look, you know, yes, that's out there. Uh, you know, this idea that uh, there were uh, there were cases of ballots that were brought out in the middle of the night in a voting place in Fulton County, Georgia. Well, in fact, what you saw in that video was only part of the story. And Brad Raffensperger, who is the Secretary of State of the state of, of Georgia, has actually addressed all of that. And here's the answer. So you know we. But as you can as you can imagine, uh, those sorts of discussions, and I'm sure many of them have engaged in them, uh, in one context or another, are uh, they're time consuming uh, and they're often emotionally exhausting. Um, but I think that, that we, as a country, it's a very easy thing to, to say, but I think we as a country have to have the, the patience and the respect for one another uh, to actually engage in uh, in those conversations. I'm not to suggest that, that that's that's the ultimate answer. Uh, but if, if we want to contribute to a solution, that's the sort of thing I think that we as individuals need to be able to do while we're searching for some uh, uh, more broad based, uh, if you will, means, whether through a commission or otherwise, of, of addressing uh, some of this, uh, this misinformation that's out there. Great. Um, lots of questions coming in here, so I'm just going to start at the top and we'll, we'll work our way through these. Uh, the next one is, should the Capitol Police have used more force or even deadly force in response to the attack on the Capitol? And if so, why do you think they didn't? You know, that, that, that's interesting. And you know, we talk about conspiracies and lots of conspiracies have been uh, circulating around about the, about the Capitol Police. And of course, there were a couple of individuals who took selfies with, with the uh, uh, with the demonstrators and the, uh, the people who broke into the, the Capitol. Um, but I, uh, just expressing a personal opinion here, uh, I, I'm glad that there wasn't more use of deadly force. Uh, there are some people who, who claim otherwise, including uh, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, of all people, who thinks that they should have been shooting at people. Um, it, it seems to me that that quite sensibly, when police realized that they were they were overwhelmed, uh, number one, and although violence was being used against them, that they, they weren't being fired upon. Um, and uh, I think that again, I'm kind of putting myself in their shoes, but I think that they they realized very quickly. Look, our our job here is to protect uh, the members of Congress and the staffers. And uh, for instance, in the, the instance where a, a Capitol a policeman you know, did fire at a, at a woman who was breaking into the House chamber when there were members of, of Congress in there, I, I believe, although I've, I've never you know, seen this uh, definitively said, I believe that he, he felt that he was uh, defending uh, the people whom he is charged to defend uh, against an imminent violent physical threat. And that's why he fired when he did, whether whether rightly or wrongly, and and, and absent situations like that where where people are in imminent physical danger, I think it would have been it would have been wrong uh, to engage in, in deadly violence. And I'm very glad that that in fact they did not. Um, I, I I don't believe that it was a it was a conspiracy. Um, I, I think that you know there there is legitimate speculation about well would. Would uh, Capitol Police have given uh, the, uh, the the rioters the benefit of the doubt that many of them apparently did, uh, if that had been uh, thirty thousand Black Lives Matter protesters defending on the cap on the uh, on the mall and, and attacking the Capitol? I don't know, um, but in any case, I, I'm glad that uh, that we didn't have more uh, more deadly violence than in fact we saw. Yeah, certainly we've seen enough death in this country and world this year, right? Yeah. Um, the next question uh, goes a little bit more global, and there's actually a few questions along these lines, but what should be the USA's role in combating global far-right extremism, and how should the CIA be involved in this? And there's a few more specific questions about certain countries and what's going on around the world right now, but I think we'll sort of leave it generally. Yeah, obviously, uh, what we're seeing uh, in uh, in the United States is not occurring in a vacuum, and we're seeing a, a resurgence of um, of uh, right wing thinking and, and to some degree uh, right wing violence, uh, right wing political movements uh, in uh, in the Western world, and uh, I think that in many cases it, it's it's in response to. Uh, perceived challenges, whether it, a huge wave of, uh, of immigration 
uh, in uh, in Western Europe and uh, and elsewhere. Uh, other things, uh, other other uh, 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 events and trends uh, that that people see as being extremely threatening to their way of life. And uh, I think that this this sort of, this sort of right wing reaction is something that we're seeing in many different parts of the world in uh, in response to it. Um, with regard to, uh, and I, I think that as a matter of public policy, I think it's extremely important that, that the U.S. be uh, be consistent uh, about this, and, and I think that the, that the U.S. Uh, has, and I think that we have been supportive as a government, uh, generally speaking, of, uh, if you will, uh, you know, democratic uh, voices, and, and often, you know, the, the, the voices uh, on the, the, the far right in whatever country we're, we're talking about are, are often uh, at least on the surface or, or without digging very deep, uh, fundamentally uh, anti-democratic. Um, so I, I think we've been consistent about that. And I think we need to do that in terms of what, for instance, that the CIA ought to be doing uh, clandestinely about that. that that's, a, that's a very difficult and, and fraught issue. And um, uh, well, first of all, just to, as, a, as a point of information, in order for the CIA to do that, they have to have a specific signed directive from the president of the United States that is authorizing them to do that. That's not part of, of what the CIA does under its, its normal authorities. Uh, normally, the CIA is only uh, empowered uh, to, uh, to collect information and to analyze it. Uh, but obviously, there are many instances in which, uh, in which CIA uh, gets involved in trying to influence uh, thoughts uh, and, uh, and, and views and, uh, and political trends uh, in uh, in other countries, uh, I personally have been engaged in some of those efforts, and uh, and typically that is uh, th that occurs in in countries which uh, which are not democratic themselves, and where there are many other, if you will, uh, illegitimate um, uh, influences at work, where you know, we, we try to get involved in, in the mix and and push things in and what we think is the is the right or what the U.S. government thinks is, is the right policy direction. Doing that in, uh, in a fellow democracy is much more problematic, uh, something that, uh, at least to my knowledge, the U.S. government has not been engaged in since uh, uh, the, the very early days of the, uh, of the Cold War, when, for instance, the CIA was involved in, in trying to uh, defeat the Italian Communist Party in the, the early days after World War II. Um, but I, I think, I think there, there, is, there, there is a role for the CIA to play, but I think that it has to be very, very carefully thought out, has to be very uh, carefully focused. Uh, that uh, I think it should only be uh, conducted uh, under under specific circumstances, uh, uh, among which uh, is the uh, the possibility of, of at least some some degree of success. And in the context of other democracies, uh, it, it's probably something that we should stay away from. And it's certainly something that you know you don't want to be caught at. And uh, and if, if you can't afford to get caught, then maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Um, hi. Uh, so after learning a little bit about like your background and what you've done, uh, how would you compare, uh, and also just as someone who's like interested in some of the roles you've had and whatnot, how would you compare uh, the story of Hamid Karzai and the insurgency in Afghanistan to maybe like the insurgency, you would call it on the events of Gen 6, than the, uh, the relationship between them and leadership? Yeah, yeah, that, that's an interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting question. So this is Benjamin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, it's a very interesting uh, question, and, and good on you to to be uh, uh, drilling so deep in, into the history here. And uh, you, you know what I, I mentioned in uh, in that that, that article uh, in, in the New York Times that uh, I've been on both sides of the equation. I, I've uh, I've supported insurgents and I've supported you know counterinsurgents. And uh, when we were supporting Hamid Karzai, uh, he was an insurgent. Uh, the, the de facto government in Afghanistan was the Taliban. And, uh, and so he was leading uh, a small insurgent movement against the Taliban that we were supporting. So uh, I, I think you ask it an extremely important and relevant question. So if we think that what Hamid Karzai was doing and which we as a government supported, um, well, then how does that stack up with what uh, you know, individuals were doing on the uh, on the sixth of January, and 
And um, in point of fact, one of the things that, that we can see is that the individuals who were photographing themselves and others inside of the Capitol transparently did not think that they were doing anything wrong. They weren't trying to hide what they were doing. They felt that they were on the side of justice, that here, this was a stolen election. Uh, Congress was there certifying a stolen election. And in defense of the US Constitution, they were gonna to try to keep that from happening. And so that, that's why I, I think that this whole idea of, of the stolen election, why I focus on that so much uh, is, be, uh, is because that is what I think legitimizes um, the, the actions that, that people you know, took on that day and that many people still believe uh, was, uh, was legitimate. Uh, and, and which could easily uh, foment further violence it, uh, in this country. And so, you know, if, if I believed and I had you know, compelling evidence that this was a stolen election, you know, quite frankly, uh, I, I, whether I would engage in violence myself, I don't know, but, but I would take um, a much more benign view of those who are willing to engage in violence in defense of their own liberty. So, you know, if, if you agree that, that you know, that, that our political system has been undermined and is no longer legitimate, then it seems to me that that, that that legitimizes types of resistance that under other circumstances would, would absolutely uh, not be legitimate. So, um, so yeah, that, that's why I think that this issue is one that's, that's just so important uh, to, uh, to address because I think that Hamid Karzai was absolutely doing the, the, the right thing. He was, he was resisting not only a, a terrorist supporting government, but, but uh, a government that was, uh, was viciously repressing uh, large elements in Afghan society, including their own supporters. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think that that's an extremely uh, important issue, extremely important point, and I'm very glad that you raised it. Great, thank you, Benjamin. Um, I'm going to combine a bunch of questions. It seems we have a lot of curiosity about your story and your past and sort of how things came to be for you. But uh, could you comment about your time here at Williston and if, you know, if it did affect your trajectory into your career and your adult life, um, maybe how? And then others are very interested in how you got into the CIA and what it was like to be a, a big decision maker during the 9-11 time. Well, wow, this, this uh, is quite a, a raft of questions, yeah, and I, and you know, I, I, um, you know, I, 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 I try to think back, you know, myself, you know, kind of what what led me in the directions that, that I did, and I, I can tell you, unlike you know some people that, that I know, I, I certainly uh, didn't plan, uh, you know, in, in my my early life to go into the the CIA. In fact, I had no real clear idea as to uh, what it was that, that that I wanted to do, and and. Uh, it, as I think back on my experience at Williston, which I guess for most people in high school was a was an extremely important formative experience for me, and, and one that I, I greatly valued, and that I'm still grateful. Um, that uh, I guess I was I was exposed to individuals, both students and particularly the faculty, who. Um, for lack of a better way of putting it, I, 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 looking back on it now, I think we, we're, we're free thinkers. I mean, the, the, these were individuals who encouraged us to look at, at, um, uh, at things and issues, whether in the context of history or the context of literature, um, in, uh, in very open ways and uh, to take any view at, uh, at all, so long as we were able to, to back up and substantiate it. And, um, and it just, uh, just the range of individuals and, and characters that I met at, at, uh, at Williston. And when you think about it, it's a relatively small school and it's a relatively you know, a small, finite uh, universe of people that, that, I, uh, that I met there. And yet they, they had such a huge influence on me. And I can say a much greater influence uh, than, than my professors at Dartmouth. Um, and for, for reasons that I'm not sure I fully understand myself or could fully, uh, fully articulate. But you know, as to you know, how I ended up you know, taking the path that I did uh, in life, I, I've always been extremely bad at, uh, at career planning. But I guess if I have a, a strength, 
It's uh, in recognizing an opportunity when I see it. And uh, I, I only had a vague idea. It, frankly, I think it was my interest in, in history and government that I picked up at, uh, at Williston uh, and really never developed when I was at, at Dartmouth. And as I was you know, sort of casting about after graduation from college, trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to do in life, uh, my initial idea, uh, frankly, was to teach in a prep school uh, because I loved Williston so much. I thought, well, yeah, I, I'm, that's my comfort zone. I, I want to go back there. Um, but wait, I, I think it was a little bit too early in my life, you know, to deal with, with other adolescents. I didn't have the level of maturity, I think, that I, I really needed to be a faculty member. So I started looking for other things. And uh, I'd always had this interest in government and, uh, and, in, um, uh, and in history. And so uh, I, I got a master's degree in, uh, in foreign affairs. Still wasn't really quite sure what I wanted to do with that. Uh, you know, it, and through uh, a chain of accidents that I, I won't uh, I won't trace here, I just happened to find myself in an interview uh, with a recruiter from from CIA, and I had really no idea what I wanted to do there. Uh, and in fact, when the recruiter asked me, well, what, what I was doing there, what I wanted to apply for, I, I really didn't know. <laughs> but she was very patient with me, and um, and uh, I, I quickly realized that I would kind of stumbled on something here that was really quite fascinating. And the next thing I knew was 27 years later. So um, again, I, I guess it's the, the power of serendipity, which is uh, which is sort of a, a, a shaped my career. Uh, and uh, speaking of serendipity, you know, I, I just happened to be uh, I, I'd gone through the the the, uh, the, the process uh, when I went to CIA. I very much wanted to go to the Middle East and South Asia. That's all I wanted to do. I was just fascinated with, with those areas, politically, culturally. Uh, the Middle East was very, very important uh, politically uh, to the United States uh, in those years and since. And so that I, you know, when it was one of my uh, young early mentors in the CIA said, you know, always march to the sound of the guns. Well, you know, I, if you're looking for trouble, that was the place to go. And um, and uh, I just happened to, uh, to be the, the, the chief of station for Afghanistan and, and Pakistan when, uh, you know, the uh, the unthinkable happened. And uh, you know, I, I really felt at the time, you know, I'm, I'm not a religious person. I'm not somebody who, you know, who, who believes that there's you know, some higher intelligence that, that that's guiding me. But I did very strongly feel when 9-11 happened and I, I found myself in that situation that although I didn't know it, everything that I had done in my career up to that point was a preparation for that. That, that was really the, the primary challenge of, uh, of my career. And although, you know, obviously, I think we would all wish, I certainly wish at the time that what happened on 9-11 uh, hadn't happened, uh, if it had to happen, I was very, very glad that, that I was there uh, to deal with it rather than, than wondering what it would have been like and what I might have done. Yeah, thank you. And this next question is sort of related, but going back to Afghanistan, the long US military presence there, what do you think the future holds there? And do you see the Taliban as part of the solution um, moving forward? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, a very topical issue right now. Uh, as, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, the US has committed itself um, uh, to uh, withdraw the last of its troops uh, by the 1st of May, uh, according to uh, the, the, uh, an agreement that was negotiated by the, by the, uh, the Trump administration. With uh, with the Taliban, um, I think it's also very clear that uh, even in the context of that agreement that we reached with the Taliban, the Taliban uh, has not upheld its side of, of the bargain. Uh, they were supposed to work toward a, uh, a cessation, or not a cessation, but a um, uh, a reduction uh, in violence. And what they have done and instead is is uh, cease attacks against the US presence, uh, not wanting to get in, in, in the way of the US departure. And instead they've stepped up violence against uh, Afghan civilians and uh, both the security forces and, and, uh, and, uh, and civilians uh, in Afghanistan. And that's not what was anticipated in that agreement. So uh, going forward, uh, I, I think that the, the Biden administration is, is very torn on this. On the one hand, I think they would like to uh, to depart uh, the, this uh, forever war. On the other hand, uh, this is not the sort of uh, of an agreement that they themselves, I think, would have negotiated. Uh, and I think they fully realize that uh, if the last of the American troops leave, it could very well lead to a collapse of the current Afghan government. 
and, uh, and, and the, the, at least the possibility of uh, another reign of terror, if you will, on the part of the, uh, of the Taliban. And so uh, just to very quickly express my own view, uh, I, I'm very much hoping that, uh, that the US will not immediately uh, depart. Uh, I, 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 I hasten to add that I was very much opposed to the, uh, the surge, the so-called surge that, that took place uh, in Afghanistan under, uh, under President Obama, when uh, at the high point we had 100,000 American troops in Afghanistan, which I thought was absolutely absurd, was probably doing uh, much more harm uh, than good. I think that our commitment of, of resources, uh, both, uh, both human uh, and financial, you know, should be commensurate with our level of national interest. And I think that we do have a counterterrorism interest in Afghanistan, which we could spend some time uh, elaborating on, but I don't think that it is it, it is a, a, a a very strong or very or extremely compelling one to the extent that we ought to be uh, uh, posting large numbers of, uh, of U.S. troops and intelligence operatives in uh, in Afghanistan. Currently, we have about 3,500, and and I think anywhere between 3,500 and a maximum of 5,000 is probably fine uh, to do what what I believe we ought to be doing. Uh, with uh, with a, a relatively small risk to uh, uh, American life, but I think that after 20 years, I, I'm not one of the ones who say that. Well, you know, we, we in order to to validate the sacrifices of others, we should continue on in the same line. But I do believe that after 20 years in Afghanistan, we do have a, a certain level of responsibility, and that we shouldn't be trying to to fight the war uh, for. Uh, anti-Taliban Afghans, but that we we should be willing, at least to a certain degree, to support those who do. And as long as they are willing uh, to do that on their own behalf, I think that the U.S. ought to support them. And then to, again, I'm sorry, I'm going on much much too long here, but uh, but as far as the Taliban role in uh, in Afghanistan, uh, th there will be uh, inevitably. Uh, a, a Taliban role in the in the future uh, of Afghanistan, political and otherwise. Uh, but I, I think I have a certain amount of insight uh, into the, the Taliban. I don't think that they are capable of participating in a coalition government. Uh, it's just not in their DNA. Uh, and I fall back on what one of the founders of the, the Taliban, who's no longer an active member of the Taliban, still respected by them, uh, but a founding member and somebody whom uh, I've been able to develop a relationship with. And he says, you know, we really shouldn't, we, the Taliban shouldn't be in government. We should be the force that stands behind the government to, to help make sure that, that they follow the correct path. And I think something along those lines is probably, if there is a, a correct role for the Taliban in the future, I think that's probably it, but they're a long way from it now because they think that, that victory is in their grasp and, uh, and they're going to continue to pursue it. Great, thank you. I'm going to try and squeeze in one, maybe two more questions before we run out of time here. Uh, we've got some great questions lined up. Here's one. You said you, uh, sorry, you said that we should focus more on enforcement of the laws that we already have rather than creating new laws. Mm -hmm. But law enforcement is not politically neutral. The way they treated the January 6th insurgents and the way that they treated civil rights protesters this summer are totally disparate. Isn't this partly a problem of whom the state will administer just punishment to and whom it will not? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, th that is definitely an issue. Um, I don't think that there's, there's any question about that. And, um, you know, I, 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 just, I just saw today, you know, and, and it, forgive me, this, this may or may not be, uh, be, uh, germane to the to the question, but just minutes before we got on this afternoon, I, I saw a story, and it's a story about. Uh, and we'd heard about the, these two before. At least uh, I I'd, I'd seen something about them. Two police officers uh, in Rocky Mount, Virginia, little town, in southern Virginia, conservative town, and they uh, in earlier, uh, I guess. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess, yeah, last year they had a number of Blacks Lives Matter Matters uh, protests in Rocky Mount, Virginia. And it was a young Black woman who was the organizer of those protests. And at one of, of uh, their rallies, these same two cops were there with her and taking selfies with her. And she befriended them. And she felt that, that, that these folks were, were, uh, were, were sympathetic. Those same two cops took a cephalia of themselves in Statuary Hall in the Capitol during the, the, uh, the incursion 
of January 6th. And as that has come out, it has excited a tremendous amount of commentary on both sides. And here, this young woman who is organizing these protests is saying, I can't believe that I befriended these people, that I thought that they were sympathetic to us when here they were standing shoulder to shoulder with all these white supremacists, you know, and, and, and being given uh, a, a, a certain amount of license to do so by, by law enforcement at the Capitol. And there are other people in the town who are saying, yeah, good on you. Uh, you're standing up for, for America. You're representing me. And it, it seems to me that that sort of captures, you know, the, the, the nub of it. Um, you know, so I, I guess I, I would point out that I, I think that it, it's, this is just one person's opinion, but I, I do think that the attitude of, of a great many of, of those police officers uh, who, although the, the vast majority of them were carrying out their, their responsibility and they were trying to resist allowing people to go into the Capitol, um, probably in their heart of hearts were, were sympathetic to some of the under, underlying motivations uh, that caused the, the, the people to uh, to do that, and and uh, I I strongly suspect that it affected the way in which in which they um, uh, they dealt with uh, many of the protesters. Uh, I think that they would have been much more inclined to use deadly violence, which again, thank God, I, I'm glad that they did not. But they might have been much more inclined to do it uh, if again these had been Black Lives Matter protesters. Um, so you know, it's, this really touches on you know, some, some really, really important themes in, uh, in American uh, social and political life right now. And I, I don't have, uh, beyond that, I really don't have a, a, an easy answer to it, other than the fact that I, I think we need to be extremely mindful uh, of all of this and, uh, and, 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 and that therefore the, the heart of justice is, is treating like situations like and I think that that's something we, we, we need to demand of ourselves and also of law enforcement. Certainly seems that there's always more questions than answers this year. Um, and I think we probably could go on for a few more hours with the questions that have come up, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, I do want to thank you so much for joining us today. I think this has been so interesting and, and I wish we had a way to keep going and going, but um, our students do need to get to class. So. <laughs> Um, hopefully some history and government classes are going to keep going on these discussions, but uh, I wish we could have a, you know, rounding a big round of applause for you in a, a chapel right now, but, um, but just trust me that we're all saying thank you so much and we really appreciate your time here today. Well, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed this and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks very much. All right. Have a great day, everybody.